when you observe the five precepts as you did just now, we must understand why you observe the five precepts. It is important to understand that most people who observe the five precepts, they only recite the five precepts when they come to the temple. But when they go home, they might be quarreling with the neighbors or maybe quarreling with uh, between husband and wife or maybe quarreling with the children and uh, all kinds of things are happening. Why is this? That means it is so difficult to practice the five precepts. There is a reason for this. The reason is that our minds are narrow. The minds, when the mind is narrow, we are thinking mainly about ourselves. So if we are mainly concerned about ourselves, we are not very much concerned about other people. That is a narrow mind. This is why some people believe that the five precepts are based on a belief in karma and rebirth. Now, if the five precepts are based on karma and rebirth, what is karma and rebirth doing? Karma and rebirth is punishing and rewarding people. So if we practice the five precepts based on karma and rebirth, that is a selfish kind of morality. that selfish kind of morality is for immature people and for animals. But the teaching of the Buddha is not based on karma and rebirth. It's very important to understand that. The teaching of the Buddha is based on what is called metta. Metta is the Pali word the Sanskrit word is Maitri. And that word means universal goodwill 
or universal benevolence or a universal interest in the welfare of all beings, a concern about the welfare of all beings. That means it is a broad mind, not a narrow mind. So the five precepts are practiced not to avoid punishment or to gain rewards. The five precepts are practiced because we are concerned about the welfare of others. The five precepts are mainly concerned about how we relate to other people. The first precept is about not harming anyone. Second precept is about not stealing. Third precept is about not committing adultery. And the fourth precept is about Controlling our speech, which hurts other people. And the fifth precept is about taking intoxicants or being carried away by our emotions, so that we begin to hurt others. So we are trying to avoid that. So all that is based on how we relate to other people. It is based on a concern for the welfare of all beings. Not only thinking about ourselves. It is based on a broad mind. That breadth of mind is what is called metta or maitri. This is why I call it universal benevolence or universal goodwill. We cannot have metta for one person This is why it is not just love. Love is something that you can have for just one person. But metta is for all beings. You cannot have metta even for the people of your own country. Patriotism is not metta. Mitta cannot be only for human beings with no compassion for animals. That is not metta. Metta is for all beings. It is a concern for the welfare of all beings. That is the broad mind where we think of all beings. It is very important to understand this because the morality or ethics of the teachings of the Buddha is 
is based on a broad mind and when we cultivate metta we are cultivating a broad mind and when we cultivate metta metta turns into karuna karuna is not another kind of thought or a different kind of mental state karuna is an expansion of metta metta grows into karuna when we practice metta metta grows into karuna then what is karuna karuna is where we don't distinguish between ourselves and others that others are as important as ourselves so metta is like the depth dimension no i'm sorry karuna is like the depth dimension metta is like the length and breadth the area dimension when we talk about volume we are talking about length breadth and height these are three dimensions so karuna is the third dimension metta is two dimensional like area dimension we are spreading out to include all beings in the universe and karuna is how deeply are we interested in the welfare of all beings just as a mother thinks of her only child and is even willing to sacrifice her own life for the sake of this child in the same way we begin to become concerned about the welfare of all beings and we lose our selfishness in karuna the selfishness disappears just like a river falling into the ocean and loses its identity it becomes the water of the ocean the river is no more in the same way when karuna appears the self disappears and that disappearance of self
means all unhappiness disappears because all unhappiness is self-centered i don't have this i don't have that i feel like this i hate this that kind of thinking is the unhappiness the suffering the when that self centered thinking disappears there is no unhappiness anymore you become happy as a result that happiness of selflessness is called mudita so mudita is happiness but not self centered happiness it is the happiness of selflessness this is why although the buddha was aware of the sufferings of all beings he was never unhappy he was happy all the time otherwise he should have been crying all the time because he saw the unhappiness of all being although he was aware of the sufferings of all beings he was happy that happiness was the happiness of selflessness that is mudita now that mudita or happiness is not an emotional excitement mudita is not an emotional excitement even metta is not an emotional excitement and karuna is not an emotional excitement and mudita is not an emotional excitement it is a very calm tranquil state of the mind so you see metta karuna mudita and these are not different states of the mind it is the same state seen from different angles just as we can take a picture of this hall with a camera we can turn the camera in different directions and take the pictures and every picture will be different but we are all taking a picture of the room
So in the same way, when we speak of metta, karuna, mudita, and upekka, we are looking at the same state of mind from different angles. And what is upekha? When the mind is calm and tranquil, the mind is not centered on what is going on outside. Whatever is going on outside does not disturb the mind. Gain and loss, fame and ill fame, Praise and blame, pleasure and pain, these are the eight vicissitudes of life. The changing vicissitudes of life. When these vicissitudes change, the mind is not disturbed because the mind is focused within, not outside. That is the perfect tranquility of mind. That perfect tranquility of mind means the mind is focused within, not looking for pleasure outside, not looking for happiness outside. That is the meaning of upekka. Upa ikkati. Upa means inside. Upper means outside. The mind is not focused on the outside. The mind is focused on the inside. And when the mind is focused on the inside, what does the mind see? The mind does not see a self there. Normally, when the mind is focused inside, we begin to see a self. Why do we see yourself? Because every experience contains two factors an experience is either seeing with our eyes or hearing with our ears or smelling with our nose or tasting with our tongue or touching with our body. 
these are the experiences and in every experience there are two parts one we call the objective part the other we call the subjective part the objective and the subjective the objective is what we see if we think of seeing what we see is the object the subjective is the process of seeing the process of seeing we personalize and say this seeing is mine the moment we personalize the seeing that seeing becomes myself i see i am seeing i am seeing the object which is outside i see a rat or i see a wall or i see a table or i see a chair so the seeing part is mine and the object seeing is something outside so we personalize the subjective part of the experience and we alienate the objective part so it is by personalizing the subjective part that we create a self the self is created through personalization of the subjective but when we are able to observe this happening we begin to see that the self and the world outside are just a creation of our mind we are creating the world and we are creating the self that lives in the world and when we begin to understand this properly a paradigm shift occurs a paradigm shift means we begin to see things in a different way there are two ways of looking at the same experience 
I call it the existential way of looking and the experiential way of looking. Existential way of looking means that we are thinking of a subjective existence and an objective existence. The subjective existence is myself. I exist. And the objective existence is whatever is in the world outside. The objective existence. And when we think of this existence, there occurs a relationship a relationship between the subject and the object, the I and what is in the world. That relationship is an emotional relationship. The emotional relationship comes in the form of a desire or a hatred or a fear or a worry. That is how suffering comes into being. Suffering is simply the emotional relationship. It is a disturbance of the mind as well as the body. That disturbance is the suffering. And that disturbance occurred because we created an existence of a subject and an object. And the existence is created by the emotional reaction that personalizes the subjective and alienates the objective. So, this way we are producing suffering automatically by the way we think. So it is by becoming aware of this properly that the paradigm shift occurs where we begin to give up the existential way of thinking and we observe the experiential way of thinking where we begin to become aware of this experience that is going on
automatically due to the presence of the necessary conditions. And that full awareness of this process of perception is the attainment of what is called nirvana. Nirvana means the imperturbable serenity of mind. The mind can, that can never be disturbed. Of course, to understand this fully, we have to achieve a certain degree of calmness and tranquility of mind. It is only with that tranquility of mind that this can be seen properly and to achieve that state of tranquility we must be able to broaden our mind and think of all beings it starts with Controlling our behavior, which is called sealer, and the sealer is achieved by taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The Buddha is the one who reached that state of perfection and Dhamma is that teaching of the Buddha that shows the way to that state of perfection and Sangha means the followers of this teaching of the Buddha who carry the teachings into the world and into the future from generation to generation. So by taking refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha we begin to practice the sila which starts with the five precepts and ends up with purity of mind or tranquility of mind by broadening the mind and by broadening the mind we begin to become aware of the experience and by becoming aware of the experience as an experience as an impersonal experience which is brought about by the presence of the necessary conditions.
has everything in the world, everything that happens in the world happens only due to the presence of the necessary conditions. They are all impersonal happenings. There is no person involved. When this is properly understood, we gain freedom from all suffering. And that is the ultimate attainment of the imperturbable serenity of mind. So I hope you understood 